Glory to God. We thank the Lord our God, the Father of all spirit, the God of all flesh. And we celebrate every father in the house, those in the auditorium, those watching online, and of course all the fathers in the body of Christ, especially the fathers of faith. We thank them, we honor them for their labors. We are here because they accepted the call. It's our prayer that every father will fulfill purpose in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Tonight, I want to share with us on a sensitive topic. I titled it, Fundamentals of Spiritual Warfare. <laughs> Can you give me a little volume? Uh, my, my voice is exhausted. In Psalm 144, verse 1, the psalmist made a statement that thrilled my heart so much. He said, The Lord teaches my hands to fight and my fingers to war. <laughs> the Lord, blessed be the Lord, my strength. We teach at my hands to war and my fingers to fight. You see, we were redeemed kings and priests unto God. Every one of us has been brought into the family of God and by an act of God's sovereignty and benevolence, He didn't just ordain us servants. Of course, in serving his purpose and will, we sustain the disposition of servants. But in manifestation and essence, we were ordained kings and priests. And when you study your Bible, we will discover the cardinals of priesthood and kingship borders on dominion. When you are dealing with the subject of priesthood, first, it's an act of ministering to the Lord, extolling him in his majesty. And then, the second aspect of priesthood is litigation and legislation. So priests are actually legal entities in the spirit. And their job is to write laws and to enforce written laws so that by all means the will of God will find expression and then kings are entities in the kingdom of God that are saddled with the authority to exercise dominion that's why I said where the word of the king is there is power who can say unto him what doest thou if we are going to function as priests as kings then we cannot by any means, take for granted the place of warfare. Ha <laughs> Hallelujah. I am truncated. <laughs> Can we celebrate God's servant, Reverend Sam Abba? He's an elder in the land. It's an honor to have you, sir. This is a pleasant surprise. Glory to God. And so in order to function in dominion, we must put on the garment of warriors. He said, the Lord teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Jesus himself speaking in the book of Matthew, he says, upon this revelation, the revelation of Christ, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So redemption does not excuse you from warfare. Redemption actually fortifies you for warfare. And so for those of us who are redeemed, we are not necessarily fighting to win. I told you last Sunday that come what may, we will win. However, 
we must know that we are fighting from victory. Because the one who actually wore was Christ. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The devil is a defeated foe. But you see, it's in the nature of Satan to rebel. So he will not relax and say, oh, I've been defeated. He wants to find out if you know. And so the reason for a service like this is to make sure every one of us know. So that when he comes, you will tell him, I'm aware. And you will keep your victory and maintain your stand in dominion and in all that God has made available to you. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible said, be sober, be vigilant. It said, for your adversity, the devil. It said, he prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Yes, you are a king. Yes, you are a priest. Yes, you have dominion. But the devil is knocking and checking to find out who knows. And so if he comes and you do not know, you will become a victim. So the Bible admonishes you ahead of time. He said, be sober, be vigilant. In fact, Paul reiterating the same emphasis, he said, we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. We know he's walking over time to bring us into captivity. But a generation of warriors will rise that will tell the devil, remain on the floor. You have been defeated. We will not give you any chance to exercise tyranny. Ephesians 4.27, he said, giving no place to the devil. You will not give him half a chance because you will live to fulfill everything God has apportioned for you in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, one thing you need to understand about warfare is that you don't choose the battle. It's the battle that chooses you. If it's a battle that one chooses, some of us would have avoided it. But it's unfortunate that the Bible calls him your enemy. I don't know when we met. I don't know when I had a misunderstanding with him. But he has taken the position of being your sworn enemy. He said, your adversary, the devil. He has put himself as your enemy. And he has brought a battle to your doorstep. And as a noble, you must fight. Nobles, we don't back out. We stand to defend our territory. You don't back out. He came with a fight. You will give him a fight of his life. Ephesians 6-12, the Bible said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. When did you get into the ring? The war chose you. And so your duty is to prepare to fight and to secure and defend your victory. 2 Corinthians 3, 10 verse 3. He said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. That means the moment you put on this flesh, you became an enemy of Satan. And when you gave your heart to Christ, you became a sworn enemy. This is why you must understand the fortification required for you to walk in victory. Listen, those making impact are not making impact by luck. They are making impact by dominion. The devil fought them and keeps fighting, yet they keep winning. Every time we testify, that same spot could have been the part, part of our defeat. The reason is a testimony is because we stood our ground, we enforced our victory, and the devil went back. And so everybody testifying is a champion. He conquered. That's why he testified. That same spot, others fell. Because the Bible says if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because your God is not strong. He it says it's because your strength is little. This is why he said be vigilant, be sober, build capacity. There is a war at your doorstep. And if you will fulfill purpose, you must first of all conquer. The beautiful thing is that we are more than built and prepared to conquer. Everything is to our advantage. And that's why we are not fidgeting when the devil comes. We tell him, throw your best shot. You will be disappointed. Because we are walking from victory. We are not walking to victory. Somebody give the Lord a big hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. Now, for you to step into this arena of battle, there are a few things 
you must understand in addition to the introduction that I have given you. I'm trying to keep it a bit calm so that we can read verses of scripture. You need to have these verses and apply them. Glory to God. The first thing you need to know is your enemy. If you don't know your enemy, you may take him for granted. So it's important for you to understand him. That's why Paul said, we should not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. If we are, we will be in trouble. Second Corinthians 2 verse 11, it said, Let Satan shall get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That means if you don't know your enemy, he will have an advantage. And this is why many Christians who should be champions are struggling because they didn't take time to understand who the enemy is. And so the first thing I will do tonight is to show you the authority structure of Satan. And then I will show you the weapons of Satan. And then I will show you his battle strategy before I show you your own weapon and advantage. Because if you don't know who he is, even if you are using your weapon, you may misfire. Glory to God. In dealing in the demonic realm, there are two categories of entities that war against the Christian. There are demons and there are princes. Demons are servants in the demonic realm or in the realms of Satan. Princes are not servants. They are fallen angels. And so they are, even the Bible acknowledges them as dignitaries. If you study the book of Job, you are going to see that they are called dignity. I'm not trying to exalt Satan. I'm just telling you facts of scripture so that you are well positioned to fight your battle. Glory to God. When you deal with demons, they don't have legality and jurisdiction because, number one, demons are disembodied entities and because they don't have bodies, they cannot function in any environment unless they take on another body so the weakness of demons is that they need a body of an entity for them to function this is why demons have to possess men in order to transmit their errand and so when you show up especially if a christian is involved they what the first thing you do is to address the legality we are bought with a price. The body you are trying to afflict belongs to Jesus. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, 19 and 20, it says he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And he said, we were bought with a price. So our body is no longer our own. Our body belongs to the Lord. So every time Satan tries to do anything around anybody, it's not a negotiation. He's an illegal occupant. So you show up in the name of Jesus, you kick him out. And he has no choice but to obey. Because he doesn't have legality to function where he's trying to occupy. Now when you are dealing with a prince, a prince has a body. So a prince does not possess men. A prince exercises dominion over territory so that he will enslave men. So when you confront a prince, you are not casting him out. There is nowhere to cast him to. Jesus himself was fasting. After 40 days and 40 nights, Satan showed up. You will think that's when he's most anointed. And Satan began to engage him. Why didn't the anointing affect him? Because the man had his own body that he was wearing. So when you are dealing with princes, you need to understand that they have certain levels of legality. And the legality princes work with are the negotiations they have with men. So their job is to possess territories. And I have taught you before, if you study Ephesians chapter 6, let's take it from verse 10. This is Paul speaking, you know, this man understands grace. He understands the authority of a believer. But he's showing you dynamics of warfare that if you don't understand, you'll be a victim. He said, finally, after he has taught them everything about new creation, he said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I wish I had time to deal with power. Because the kind of power he was talking here is advanced dimension of power. 
At this level, he has moved from Dunamis. At this level, he's talking Iskus and Kratos. Those are men who understand operations in the spirit realm. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Next verse. He said, put on. You are about to enter a warrior zone. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wise of the devil. These are not demons. These are princes. Next verse. He said, for we wrestle. We don't cast out. We cast out demons. When we meet princes, we wrestle. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers. Are you seeing that they are calling some of these guys rulers? Rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We wrestle. Hope you know, if they cast out princes, <laughs> would have stood on the altar here and say, the prince of corruption, leave Nigeria. <laughs> they, they don't possess people, so there's nothing to cast out. They exercise dominion over territories. We would have showed up and said, the demon of prostitution, leave. The demon would have gone, but it's not a demon. This is a prince. He negotiates with men. And using their will, he finds authority into a territory. So if you want to prevail in that territory, you must be ready to war. Because there is a dark cloud over that territory that you must rise above if you will exercise dominion. Now, when you study these wars in detail, a principality is a prince that comes first. It's derived from the word principle. And so these princes, they are like the first rank among the realms of fallen angels. So every time they want to take a territory, is principalities the same thing? Who are principalities? The word principality is the word al -K. It means an entity that has authority to exercise dominion through negotiation. So when a principality comes to this territory, he won't come into the land and start trying to enforce dominion. There's no legality. So what he will do first is to find out the people that have legality and jurisdiction. So he will go to you using the window of your gift. He will enter in negotiation. So those of you who are prophetic, for example, you can pick signals in the spirit. And so the principality knows that you respond to frequencies. So what he will do is that he will check to find out your lust. If he discovers your lust, he will now come into negotiation. Is that not what he was doing with Jesus on the mountain? If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. He was looking for appetites that he will exploit. But unfortunately, the one he met, all the appetites are dead. You see the problem we have? Why we will keep fighting? There are some of us who are prophets who still love women and love fornication. So when they show up, they will look for those ones and they will negotiate with them. And those ones will open the gates for the territory and so they will enter the land. They will go to some who are apostolic in nature, who have authority and they will go through the loss of power. If you want to be the strongest man, just add pride to what you are doing. Add exaggeration to what you are doing. Add lies to what you are doing. You can come to a herbalist and you see that people who have jurisdiction over territories enter negotiation. The moment they secure their allegiance, those people become a bandwidth and a radar through which the princes can enter the land. And the moment they are done, then the powers come. The word powers, there's the word exousia. And what those ones do is that they are the ones who create addiction. So you are a prophet. You're fair. You ask God to forgive you. After three months, the guy showed up and said, this thing is a cycle. You fall again. You ask God to forgive you. After two years, it becomes your lifestyle. So what you do is that you create a system that manages fornication around you. So when you are preaching, you may stand here and be shouting, I decree you will prosper. They are using your frequency to enter the land. Everybody you are speaking over, they can enter the people because their hearts are open to you. And so as you declare, they use you as a channel to enter the people. And after a while, you'll discover these same people go to government. These same people go to their academia. These same people go to economy. And they carry the same energy of seduction. So when the guy goes to his job, he sees a negotiation of two million. They say, add one zero to make it 20 million. He can't reject it because he has come under the same government. So he will compromise. And before you know what is happening, they web themselves into system. And those powers will create those addictions for you to remain there. A young lady wants to make her hair. 
She goes stand on the road. Somebody picks her up, gives her 50,000. She says it's just for her. Some even say it's for school fees. After she pays her school fees, she doesn't know why the next Friday or Saturday, she still goes back there. An addiction has come. A power has come. So when the principality finishes, he steps aside and the power shows up. And the power begins to function. When the power functions, after a while, the next guy shows up. The ruler of the darkness. The word ruler is the word magistrate. These ones are law makers. They write law. So you can come to certain territories, you'll discover that women never marry. The moment they are 22, they must give birth to a child outside wedlock. It's a law. If you enter that territory, for you to overcome that thing, your priesthood must be higher than the cloud of darkness. So your own warfare is to refuse that that manipulation will dominate you. You come to certain territories, you'll find out that people just, just go mad. And when you check, every young man from the age of 19 is high on codeine, is high on cocaine. And they think they are loving it. No, a law has been written. A law. Somebody told me some, some years ago, he was fasting and praying all night. He now relocated. See, before you relocate, ask God though. You may lose your authority and rank in the spirit just by relocation. He had not built capacity. He now relocated to a territory. And when he came there, there was the energy of seduction everywhere. He tried to pray. Prayer became difficult. Ah, is it not me that just pray five minutes have ascended? What's going on? Okay, so maybe he was tired. And the next day he rested to pray. When he wanted to pray, he didn't know that the energy level in that territory was different. The gradient had changed. He couldn't pray. After two weeks, he discovered that lust had entered his soul. In one more time, he too was looking for a girlfriend. What turned an intercessor to a harlot? It was a territorial influence. He came into a territory where he didn't have stature to pierce through the cloud. He came into a place where he set of all trances could not disarm the prison. You know, you can be living where intercessors are and they have opened the atmosphere. So you show up, you are praying 10 minutes, you see a vision. You say, yes, we are seers. You can even start a ministry and say, you know, uh, the Lord has sent us to a generation. Is that when your pride now moves you to a territory where those gatekeepers are not around. I'm not putting fear in your heart. I'm showing you the dynamics of dominion. Why do you think when you come to church, all of you are high? But when you leave church and go home, you become tired. Because this atmosphere, we have cooked it. We censored it before you came. That's why you are seeing vision. You are praying, you are crying. When was the last time you cried in the market? When was the last time you cried in your bedroom? Unless you devise the technology to monitor and cook the atmosphere, you can't find that level of ascension. And the unfortunate thing is that the bank does not have this atmosphere. The market does not have this atmosphere. The school does not have this atmosphere. This is why warriors was a mad. It said, out of Zion, saviors shall arrive. So that when you go to the bank, like somewhere, you will come with a radar. It said, Nayot in Rama. There was a radar there. The moment Saul entered, Saul began to prophesy naked. Until warriors are born, that men who don't just carry mantle, but carry atmospheres, begin to emerge. We can't take the, the war. We can't take the war. Warriors! Warriors! I'm telling you, see, when we begin to grow in warfare, people will no longer have mantles. Mantles deal with situation. There are men who will carry radars. When someone moves, he doesn't come with a mantle. He comes with a radar. So any city that somewhere enters, the whole atmosphere is open. Anybody can prophesy. Even if you are not a prophet. When Saul was prophesying, they looked at him and said, is Saul also part of the prophet? No, he's not part of the prophet. He came under a radar. That's not a mantle. That's a warrior. Nayot in Rama, the camp of the prophets. The school where prophets are born because a man created a system there. That was the same thing Ananias built in Damascus. 
when Saul was fighting in Jerusalem, the moment he entered Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Ah, who are you, Lord? I've been doing this business for long. I've never seen anything, anybody talk from heaven. Who are you? You have come into a radar. A watchman has secured an atmosphere. And God told him, go into the city. You will be told what to do. And God went to the one who had the key and told Ananias, go and meet that man. I want to use him for something. Ananias said, no. This is the man that have perfected the church. Why should I do it? God said, don't worry. I have an assignment for him. And Ananias showed up and said, brother Saul, the Jesus that appeared to you on the way have sent me. That means I may not be where you have the encounter, but I know about the encounter because the territory belongs to me. For a minute, I'm laying foundation. Please hear me. There is a contention over atmospheres because destinies can be trapped in atmospheres and destinies can be liberated under atmospheres. But men who have the rankings to alter the laws that rulers write must rise. And then you have spiritual wickedness in heavenly places you know their work their work is when you have served satan's agenda they will kill you those are the ones that uses the weapons of darkness they give you afflictions they give you sicknesses and they make sure you die frustrated they are called wickedness in heavenly places that's the cycle of demonic operations over territories this one is not for every believer. It's for sons in the kingdom. That's why you see 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 people come under an atmosphere in church. They are worshiping and praising God. But you meet them in the market on Monday, they are different people. Because they came under a web. They came under a civilization regulated by spirits, ancient spirits, like the spirit of Egypt. That keeps men in bondage. Spirit of Babylon. That bring corruption to men. They are Syrian spirits. That causes men to war. Until they are exhausted and drained. And then they disarm them. This is why beyond prophesying. Over people in church. We must teach them the secrets of the kingdom. So that they emerge as warriors. Because they go to places where we can't follow them. And what they will carry there. Is the rank that they have built in the spirit. Thank you father. Manda prahas cavradigas, zobra kido baragasta freketinas, zaga baros la coria baruskes. You know, when we share these things, right? It looks as if oh, Satan is powerful. No, these things don't reveal the power of Satan. These things reveal the excellency of the finished works of Christ, so that you realize that although this kind of robust system exists in darkness, yet we walk in victory as if Satan does not exist. You know, it's the size of your opponent that tells you what you carry. When you disarm a giant, then you discover what you carry is not small. Imagine when David confronted Goliath. The Bible took time to give you the pedigree of Goliath. He was a warrior from his youth. Men carried his sword. Men carried his shield. He was six feet tall. Twelve toes, twelve fingers. And you are thinking, who is this mammoth man? Undefeatable. A whole army fled when he screamed. But a man showed up. 
and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defiled the armies of God? Today I will kill you. I will cut off your head. The beds of the air will eat you up. And you are wondering, excuse me, sir. That man, you are at his knee level. Be careful. He said, no need for caution. When Goliath cursed him, the Bible said David charged at him. He carried something that is bigger than Goliath. And with a stone, he slung it and brought Goliath down. So when you see the size of Goliath, you will now have respect for the covenant. So the reason the ranking of Goliath was rejected is not to exhort him, it's to exhort the covenant. So when you win by the covenant, then you know that the covenant is indeed great. That's why I say, have respect unto the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are filled with the habitations of cruelty. So if you have the covenant, darkness becomes a ground of manifestation. That's why we are doing what we are doing. Thank you, Father. And we pray in the Spirit for one minute. Can we pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute? Que parota feredina no ways we release the sound of the heavens sound of creation no ways we release we release Some of you will rise as Davids, giant killers, men that carry the seven horns of the anointing, warriors, kings, poets, prophets. You will carry horns of the anointing, grown horns, and you will defy Goliath in different spheres of human influence. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Can you lift your hands? I want to proceed. But the oil won't let me. Ushers, the first three people that go down, bring them here. There's a weight coming upon them. Mantles, ancient mantles. Ancient mantles, ancient mantles. Prophetic mantles, apostolic mantles. Mantles of warriors, keepers, custodians, rulers over dominions. Wherever they are standing now, I release that oil. I release that grace. I release that grace. Step into that dimension. Yahweh!
someone here, God has sent you to the economic sphere as an apostle, but the princes have resisted you. They have resisted you. They have shut doors. They have shut gates. They have denied you opportunities. Wherever you are standing now, by the oil that exalts, in the name of Jesus the Lord, come out from that pit. I move you to your next level. I move you to your next level. Step into the next level. Step into the next level. to travel there are powers in the realm if we are ignorant although rulers and conquerors will be defeated is there I see an abomination on the face of the earth princes are trekking white beggars are riding on horses because they are not aware some of us are beclouded with ignorance we have not tapped into the realms of light where knowledge dwells to touch the body of knowledge in order to exercise dominion on the face of the earth. But this is why you are here. For the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. Every darkness in your life, they are dispersed now. They are dispersed now. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Go Rabakesto Vrakida. Sit down for a moment. Let me further fortify you with knowledge. This is how Satan fights. There are different dimensions to warfare. You need to understand it. So that when you have a weapon, you will know how to use it. Because listen, there are specific weapons for specific battles. You must have that level of understanding. So quickly, how does the devil fight? Number one is the battle of attrition. The battle of attrition is a battle that wearies out. He is not there to defeat you. He is just there to frustrate you until you are tired. So that you will give up. So one of the things you must do in warfare is to stand and say, listen, Satan, I will never give up. Because some battles are designed not to defeat you, but to make you give up. Look at the operation of Satan. Proverbs 24 verse 10. He said, if you faint in the day of trouble, it's because your strength is little. So the battle of attrition is a battle of stamina. It's a battle of strength. The devil wants to find out how long can you stand. See, this is why a Christian must build capacity. When we tell you long fasting, long prayer is for capacity. Because there are certain battles, there will be no prophetic word. There are certain battles, you can't even see the enemy. You just need to stand and weather the storm. He said, if you go through the fire, you will not be born. If you go through the water, you will not be drowned. So there are certain battles, deliverance is the ability to stand to the end. That's why Ephesians 6 10 said, having done all to stand, stand therefore, stand. The goal of the battle is for you not to give up. Because there are battles in the spirit that is meant to weary you out. See the way he operates. Matthew 4, 13. After he finished tempting Jesus and Jesus didn't fall, the Bible says, and Satan left him for a season. You didn't win now. I'm coming again. So the idea of the battle is, I will keep coming. I will keep coming. So your job is to tell Satan, any day you come, you'll meet me standing. Your, your, your prayer is, Lord, help me to stand. Help me. Paul said, I have continued to this day because the Lord has helped me. There were many things that was designed to throw him down. He refused to fall. Because he knew the battle is not about winning. It's about standing to the end. Did you not read? He said the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 24 verse 12. Because iniquity shall abound. So you come to a level where your fire for evangelism dies. Your zeal for giving for kingdom service dies. Your zeal for prayer dies. If that thing dies, you have lost. 
Your job is to stand. Whether I am blessed or not, I'll keep giving. Whether I'm delivered or not, I'll keep winning souls. Whether God answers or not, I'll keep praying. The goal is not first of all about answer. It's about becoming a man of capacity that will never back down for Satan. In Matthew 12, verse 43, the Bible says, when an evil spirit is gone out of a man, this, is, this one, Satan, is defeated. He said he goes about in dry places. If he doesn't find where to stay, he said he will return. And this time, with several more wicked demons. So the idea of this kind of battle is to prolong it until you weary out. This is why for you to be strong in warfare, you must learn how to rest and recover your strength. Men who don't know how to preserve strength, they faint in battle. It's a type of battle. The second dimension of battle is the battle of misrepresentation. The devil knows that you will not fall. So what he does is that he is to paint another image of you before men. This is where you learn to keep your peace. If you don't know how to keep your peace, every action you take, you will err. Because the idea is to make you talk, to confirm what he has said. This is where silence becomes a weapon. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You keep your calm, whatever the devil is doing. Because his goal is to misrepresent you. And those making impact, they know. Why do you think Revelation 12, 10 calls him the accuser of the brethren? He goes to one, he lies about you. He goes to another, he says things about you. And the way he paints this thing looks so real that people begin to trace certain things in your life to corroborate what Satan is saying. And you now come under pressure. You now enter the flesh, trying to counter what Satan is doing. You will fall. See, if you want to win many warfares, avoid drama. Anything the devil wants to do, let him do. Stand your ground. Stay focused. I told you people here, one of the greatest strengths in warfare is focus. What God told me when I started was to win souls, was to take territories, was to preach the gospel. If the devil likes, people should call you a thief. Win souls, take territories, preach the gospel. If the devil likes, they should call you any name. Don't worry, that's the work of Satan. Keep at what God has told you to do. And when you get to the point when you shall fight, it's God himself that will signal you. And do you know how you fight those battles? You fight it by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony of Scripture. You fight it because Revelation 12.10, the Bible called him the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.11, how did the brethren overcome? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the walls of their testimony. Now, the problem with many Christians is they don't even know how to administer the blood. You don't administer the blood by saying, I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. That's not scriptural. When you do it, God may honor your faith. But that's not how you administer the blood. There are two basic ways of administering the blood. Number one is to walk in the light of scripture. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it said the blood of Jesus cleanses us. So what releases the power of the blood is for you to walk in the light. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. So the way you release the blood is by walking in the light. Everything is happening around you. You are walking in scripture. Somebody accused you. You have the right to fight back. They say love your enemies. And so you are loving him. That's all you are doing you discover that the blood is working. The blood is working. The second way to release the blood is by the communion table. Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23 to 27. The same thing Jesus there said, he reiterated it. For I deliver unto you that which also I received of the Lord, that the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, gave them and said, eat. This is my body which is given for you. As often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death. He went further. When the supper was ended, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And then he gave them and said, take, drink. This is the blood of the New Testament. As often as you do this, he said you proclaim. So the way you proclaim the works of the cross and by implication release the blood is by breaking bread. This is why the early church that were the most fought of all churches, the Bible said daily, Acts 2, 46 to 47. 
they went from house to house. What were they doing? Breaking bread. And the more they did it, the more the blood went to work. So this battle that is designed to represent you, 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 you stop it by walking in the light or by breaking the communion table, stopping the blood, the, the cup, for the blood to work for you or by declaring the word. By declaring the word. They say you are a failure. Don't tell them I'm not a failure. That's you going to their level. When they say you are a failure, say I'm the head and not the tail. He has made me a king and a priest unto God. I overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word. You talk scripture. Leave them. Don't argue. When you argue, you go to their court. But when you are talking scripture, you come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to the judge of all, and the judge of all will acquit you. That's how you fight the battle of misrepresentation. Number three, how do you fight? What, what battle does the devil bring? It's torment. The third battle you will fight is the battle of torment. How does the devil do it? He uses fear and your weaknesses to enslave you. Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15. Please, hear these things where you will find yourself routing them from time to time. Even the strongest of us fight these battles. I can tell you by experience and by the privilege of access our fathers of faith that seem to be the most ranking, they fight those battles more than all of us. Paul said, day and night, we are buffeted. It's warfare. Torment. He said, for as much then as the children, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, were partakers of flesh and blood. He said, himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death might, de might destroy him that had power of death. That is the devil. Now, how did the devil put them in bondage? Verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the third dimension of battle is fear. The devil torments you using the gate of fear. So long as you walk in fear, you will be enslaved. If you don't win the battle over fear, you will be tormented for a lifetime. See the way Psalm 73 verse 19 puts it. He said, how are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they were utterly consumed with terror. A great people consumed in a moment by a weapon called terror. But you know what the Bible said? In 2 Timothy 1 7, it said he has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given us the spirit of power. He has given us the spirit of love and he has given us the spirit of of a sound mind the spirit of power the spirit of love and the spirit of a sound mind so you don't have fear the devil is only using fear to deceive you that's why he comes and masquerades himself but you see the way you conquer fear is in the verse before this one second timothy 1 verse 6 see what the bible said he said wherefore i put thee in remembrance that thou stare the gift of God which is indeed by the putting up of my hands. So your job is to stare the gift. If you are not stared, you will be afraid. There is power in you, but you must stare it. There is love in you, but you must stare it. There is a sound mind in you, but you must stare it. If power, love, and sound mind is not stared, fear will dominate you. And if fear dominates you, it will take you to desolation and you will become a victim of battle. This is the third dimension of the warfare that Satan brings to Christians. Number four is direct attack. There are times when Satan becomes so frustrated that he attacks Christians outrightly. Matthew 13 verse 16. Jesus saw a woman bent over. He said, ought not this woman being the daughter of Abraham. This is a child of covenant. So she was a child of covenant but Satan afflicted her. Ought not this woman. Glory to God. Is that Luke now? Luke 13, 16. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, lo, these 18 years be let loose from this bound. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. Healing all who were oppressed by who? By the devil. So there are people that Satan, you know, 
People don't know warfare, so they say things. When people tell you what they go through, please, don't go to theology and start arguing. No. There are certain things that are realities in the spirit realm. There are men and women who can't sleep. Either because they ride them like donkeys every night, or they molest them sexually. And then you are wondering, is this possible? Is this not possible? You don't know warfare. It may not be in the doctrine, but the devil violates laws. There are times when the devil violates. He's called the opposer of God. He violates the law of the spirit realm. Did you not read that the Bible says Satan turns himself to an angel of light? So he can, he can alter things in the spirit realm. The same way demons come to people in the similitude of men. Those are not permitted, but they violate laws. So that they can afflict humanity. And Satan does this with ambition because he knows that if God has any weakness, it's his love for men. Deuteronomy 32 verse 9. The Bible said, God speaking now, he said, the lost portion is his people. He said, Jacob is my inheritance. So he knows that God is omniscient, God is omnipotent, God is omnipresent. There's no way you can get God. So the only way you can get to God is to get to the one he loves. That's why he fights us with ambition. And he will violate laws of the spirit to come against you. So there are those who are directly attacked by demons. Number five. Strategy of warfare is manipulation. The devil will compare you to make mistakes so that you are consumed. Genesis 3 from verse 1 to 7. The serpent was more subtle than all the beasts that the Lord has created. And he came to the woman and said, did God really say? When really say, questions and uncertainty begins to come, know that you are in battle. Should we really give offering? Do we really need to pray? Should we really go to church? Can't we just follow online? You are under attack. You will not know. Do you know the way some of the best hunters in the jungle are lionesses? You know the way they fight? They want to fight you. They will disconnect you from the fold so that you become a victim. Buffaloes come in their numbers, thousands. No lion will dare enter because if you enter, they will cross you. But what they do is that they move around and move around for one buffalo to be detached. The moment that one is detached, they cycle that one. It becomes a victim. Every time you start questioning the ordinances of God, you are about to make yourself a victim. Do we really need to obey all these things the Bible says? My brother, take it easy. This is 21st century. You will meet 21st century demons. The serpent in the garden is now a dragon. He no longer negotiates. He comes now to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Never question God's ordinances. It's a manipulation. Every time you start challenging God, and his ordinances, you are in trouble. 2 Chronicles 21 verse 1, the Bible said, Satan stirred David to number Israel and it was a sin against God. But Satan layered him, using pride. Come on. Number these soldiers. You guys are many now. What do you mean by God telling you not to number Israel? And out of pride, he was manipulated. The moment he did it, his first enemy became God. That's how Satan fights man. Manipulation. And he keeps giving you questions. Bringing uncertainty into your heart. So that you will err against God. That's why Hosea 4, 6b said, My people, God didn't deny us. He said, my people perish. The people of God perish. Because they lack knowledge. When Satan comes with manipulation, they give in to Satan. And Paul warned us. Ephesians 4, 27. He said, giving no place to the devil. See, anything you are doing that the Holy Ghost bear witness to, even if you don't understand it, keep doing it while you are learning. It will make you a victim. Spiritual warfare. Number seven. Satan fights us by weaponizing our environment. Your environment can be used against you. Romans 8.21 the Bible said, creation is in bondage. 
So Satan uses your environment as a weapon of war. Because the creation itself is also, shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, this is one of the responsibility of sons. We are the ones who bring deliverance to creation. But unfortunately, sons are few. So the whole creation is not yet delivered. So every creation that is still in bondage, Satan can use it to afflict you. That's why some of you think now mosquito wants to kill you with malaria. It's environment being weaponized. Even your car can be weaponized. That's why you must be a priest. Don't take anything for granted. When you pray, include your environment. Because Satan can use it against you. Listen to the way the Bible puts it. Mm. Psalm 121 verse 6. It said, the sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. These are constellations. But through astrology, Satan can use spells to cause even the constellation to work against you. Some people don't know that before they woke up, their day had already been manipulated. The sun and the moon had been sent on an errand. And you don't know why a day that was planned to be perfect, suddenly everything goes sour. Because constellations were sent on an errand to afflict you. The constellations. Satan uses the environment. Look at Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27. When Jesus was talking about building the house, he said the wind and the wave will come against it. You will think it's a prophetic statement until you saw Jesus riding in the boat with his disciples and the wind came against them to drown them. Not even afraid that Jesus was there. So there's a prophetic dimension to that scripture, but there's also a literal dimension. Satan uses waves and winds to cause destruction. Geographer will come and give you names. Tornado. <laughs> you are joking. Some tornadoes can be marshaled at your business. And they, everything will stand. Your house will be... <laughs> and I wonder, what's going on? Is Satan fighting you? That is why sons don't only deliver men. They also deliver creation from the bondage of corruption. So that Satan wouldn't use what should bless you as a weapon against you. Finally, what is the dimension of warfare Satan brings against Christians? is by putting yokes on their lives. Yokes. Yokes. One of it is what we read. Luke 13, 16. The woman was bent over. So there are many things that normal people do that she couldn't do. Yokes. And those are the kind of yokes the Bible said the anointing destroys. Isaiah 10, 27. He said the, anoint, the yoke shall be broken and the body shall be lifted off your shoulder because of the anointing. Satan is the one who puts yokes on people. And so when you find out there are many things God wants you to do, but there are limitations. Don't say it's a coincidence. Some of them are warfare grounds. Rise up against it. Some of you sleep is why you won't fulfill destiny. Unless God intervenes. You can watch movies for 12 hours, but the moment you want to read, not even the Bible, even your lecture notes, you start yawning. You start dozing off. The moment you want to pray, you start dozing off. It's a garment of heaviness. It's a body. And so if you think, oh, I'm tired, you will end up useless. When you discover that this thing is not normal again, rise up in the name of Jesus, every garment of heaviness, stopping me from pressing into my destiny. Catch fire now. You'll fight it and you'll be shot. It will be lifted. Bishop David Oedeko told the story. He said they applied every principle of church growth he knew. But nothing was happening. One day he called some of his pastors, come, let's go and pray. And they entered the church. They were praying for three days and fasting. This church must grow. It has entered warfare. You must, you must. You know, sometimes when you are fighting warfare, the action looks foolish. But that, that's where Satan hides. This church must grow. Oh God, why is this church not growing? And the Holy Ghost told him, rise up. And he rose up. Walked through the back door. And he went to the back. Now, turn, look up. He turned and looked up and saw a dark cloud. He said, this is why your church is not growing. This dark cloud misrepresents you to everybody. So when they see you people there, 
they assume a lot of evil about you. That's why they won't enter. Now, deal with it. <laughs> when God tells you to deal with it, better know how. Higher. If you don't know how, that will be your greatest undoing. And immediately, higher. You should trust Bishop now. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Satan, get out of here. The light shines in the darkness. So you must know how to use your weapon. Imagine if God showed you, this is why people are dying in your family. And do it. What will you do? Oh, this is why your church is not growing. And do it. What will you do? This is why you need to know how to use your weapons. Now, let me show you some of the weapons we have in our quiver. I will just list them because we are out of time. Then, maybe next time when we deal with the subject, I will show you how to wield some of them. The first weapon that you use in spiritual warfare is called the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. Let's read it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wives of the devil. Next verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Verse 13. We are for taking unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand, the, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. Next verse. Stand therefore. This is how to stand. It's not to stand up from a chair. Stand therefore, having your loins guilt about with truth. So if you don't know truth, you can't win. This is why we teach you the gospel. What is truth? Having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And every handwriting of ordinance that was against me, he nailed it to the cross. As I am now, Satan can't bring any accusation against me. Even if it happens, I will tell him the blood has dealt with it. And it's a business between me and my father. Get out. I don't need performance to deal with Satan. My work with God is a love relationship. And everything that should stand against me, Jesus dealt with it. This is not a ticket to live in sin, but this is deliverance against Satan. So Satan can come up and accuse me with anything. What is truth? He is seated above principalities and powers. Above every name that is named. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Ephesians 2 verse 6. We are seated with him in heavenly places. So when Satan comes, no matter how tall he is, I'll tell him I don't need height. I'm seated above you. In the name of Jesus, I address you. So you address Satan from truth. Listen, many people are praying and dying because they don't know truth. Because they are not using Bible provision. They are using their emotion. So when they pray and sweat, they think they have dealt with Satan. Sweat does not deal with Satan. No. I've told you many times. When you pray fervently, you will sweat. But your goal is not sweat. Oh. In the whole Bible, it was written only once that a man sweated. It was Jesus. The prayer was not answered. And Jesus respected himself and said, not my will, but thine. Because authority in prayer is the will of God. That is truth. So the Bible said the first weapon in battle is the belt of truth. How much truth do you know? You are going to warfare. You say somebody testified that he did like this. It happened. There are many gaps in that statement. Though. Thank God for that testimony. It will inspire you, but it's not a weapon to take to battle. You must find truth for yourself in scripture. I am the head and not the tail. Whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. Gather together, you will scatter. Take counsel together, it shall come to know. Speak the word, it shall not stand. For our God is in our midst. I know truth. I know truth. It's from the premise of truth that I pray prayers. I don't fight from ignorance. No matter how you pray, no matter how you fast, if you have not sorted the issue of the truth of the gospel that you are placed above Satan, you will never win. Number two. 
He said, having the breastplate of righteousness. Most of you, see, this is why I have a problem with our generation. People are preaching and our whole preaching is now morality. See, morality is good though, but it's not the gospel. We emphasize morality and I do it here. But after you talk morality, make sure you tell them gospel. If you tell people, don't dress naked, you are not a harlot. If you tell people, don't gamble, you are not a thief. When you finish saying that, make sure you come back to Bible and teach them who they are. Because if you quarrel them, you have not helped them. In church, they will only cooperate with you. When they go out, they will still be slaves. Many Christians don't know righteousness. They don't know it. And most of us are preaching morality, not gospel. What is righteousness? There are three basic definitions of righteousness. Number one is the nature of God. So when he said you should have the breastplate of righteousness, he's saying have the consciousness that you have God's nature. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We don't have righteousness. We are the righteousness of God. We have God's DNA. That's the first expression of righteousness. Number two, what is righteousness? It's a gift. It's not end. Romans 5.17 They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. If you don't know this, you know what Satan will do? When you are in battle, he will come and tell you, you that fought with that person, are you the one who wants to fight me? And then you will think that righteousness is your action that you end. And then you will deflate and he will address you. You are not supposed to fight. You are not supposed to keep malice. You are not supposed to sin. But don't allow Satan bring your error in battle and you succumb. You are not righteous because of what you did. You are righteous because you have a gift of God's nature. It is because you are righteous that you will do right. So, when you have that nature, and you know it's a gift, it's not end, then you become a reasonable Christian by living right because you are righteous. I am talking now because I'm a human. I have the nature to talk. That's why I'm talking. If I didn't have this nature, no matter how you scold me, I won't be able to talk. If you think it's a lie, go and buy a dove and teach it to talk for five years. It will never talk because it's not in the DNA. So there's no business telling people to live right when they don't know they have righteousness. So you first of all have to tell them it's a nature and it was not end, it was gifted. When they now understand it, you now tell them because of this nature, God expects you to live right. That's why I said in 1 John 3, 7 and 10, little children, let no man deceive you. Him that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as is righteous. So you do righteousness because you are righteous. And if you are not doing righteousness, it means you are sick. Because if I can't talk now, it's because I'm sick. So many Christians are not doing right, so they are sick. And it is that sickness that makes the devil attack them because they can't respond in faith. Are you seeing that now? Their faith can no longer respond. This is why we encourage people to live right. So that their faith can respond. But you need to know that the devil cannot bring any accusation against you. The Bible says who can bring any charge against God's elect. If I'm in the middle of battle, that's not when the celestial will bring accusation. I'll tell him in the name of Jesus, shut up. By the blood of the lamb, I'm cleansed. When I finish fighting, I will go to God. And if I have erred, I ask for forgiveness and I receive grace not to err again. But I will never allow Satan bring my fault to make me lose a battle. If you do that, it means you are not wearing the breastplate of righteousness. Carry the consciousness that you were gifted with God's nature. That's what gives you victory in battle. And while you do that, don't give any place to the devil by a sinful act. Glory to God. I'm showing you battle. This is why people are praying they are losing battles. Because they don't know the fundamentals. If you don't understand righteousness, your prayer is useless. No matter how you shout. Satan will know. There will be a fear in your heart. Oh, I didn't do this. Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, I didn't do that. And those fears are loud in the spiritual realm. Satan will say, yes, he's afraid. Now let's cut him off. 
and you'll be sure why your faith will not work because you don't understand righteousness. Next, verse 15. And your feet shove with the preparation of the gospel. This is why we encourage you to preach the gospel. Most of you who don't preach the gospel, you can't win any battle. So winning is not just about bringing people to, to the kingdom. It's a weapon in your quiver. Those of us who win souls, we win a lot of battles. Because this thing is part of the armor of God. We are ready any day, any time to go out and represent Jesus. So Satan knows us by name. They say win souls. Come, let's go for evangelism. No. They say pray for evangelism. No. They say give. No. And you are wondering why your business failed. This is why. You don't have the preparation for the gospel. You are wondering why your son is sick and you don't have an answer. This is why. When you are not ready to preach the gospel of peace, there will be a porous pot in your armor. The preparation of the gospel. Next verse. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. You must learn to trust God and God only. Do you know what we use in battle? We use prayer. We use fasting. We use the name of Jesus. But our faith is not in our fasting. Our faith is not in our prayer. I'm showing you why many prayer people die. Many fasting people die. Many givers die. When they come to battle, they start putting their confidence. I prayed seven hours. You are joking. No? I fasted 21 days. You are joking. All of that is meant to generate power. But what directs your power is your faith. And your faith is your confident assurance in God and God alone. If you put your faith in any other thing, you'll be shocked. There are people who fast for one year to see Satan. You fast for 21 days, you show up, you are talking. You know why God won't let it happen? If you win, you'll become proud. You'll say it's because of my fasting. And the way the system is designed, only God can take the praise. So you cannot win if your confidence anchors on your ability. He said, we have this treasure in eating vessel that the excellency might be of God and not of man. So pray as much as you can. And I will show you that prayer is a weapon. Fast as much as you can. I will show you that fasting is a weapon. But when you stand before Satan, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it therein. They are saved. There's only one assurance we have. It's the name of our God. Our confidence is not in what we do. Our confidence is in what our God has done for us. Our confidence is not in who we are. Our confidence is in who our God is. And so it's on the strength of who he is and what he has done that we are bold to confront Satan. You think David learned how to throw the stone when he met Goliath? No. He has been doing it. You think David learned how to fight in that battlefield? No. He said, once upon a time, a bear came, I killed it in my hands. A lion came, I killed it. But when he met Goliath, he didn't say, listen, Goliath, I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. He would have died. I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, whose army you have defied. The moment he put his faith in God, his experience in fighting bears came to work. So your abilities will be useless, except as your faith is first of all in God. This is how you fight. These things look simple, but they are the dynamics of victory in battle. I wish I had time. If it's not that it will be boasting, I would have told you about my fasting life. Some of you will be scared. Some of us now pray on the go. I thought prayer for hours was powerful until I met Andrew Womack. Andrew Womack said, you live at home with your wife. How many hours do you talk to her in a day? <laughs> talk to her. We talk from morning till night and from night till we sleep. He said, that's how you pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Discipline requires that once in a while pray for long. Pray 10 hours, pray 12 hours, pray 24 hours. Discipline requires that once in a while take a quiet time and seek God. But prayer is like bread. You talk to God while you are driving. You talk to God while you are bathing. You talk to God while you are washing. You pray on the go. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. So it's not something you do once in a while. It's your life. 
if you will survive battle. This is how this thing works. And then he said, the shield of faith will quench the darts of the devil. And finally, he said, put on the helmet of salvation. You must know everything Jesus has done for you. If you don't know it, you will be shocked that you will be a victim. Are you seeing that warfare is not just, oh, we are praying. It requires preparation to preach the gospel. It requires understanding of righteousness. It understands always standing in truth. It requires understanding the doctrine of salvation. And then he said above all, he said, take the sword of the spirit, which is the rema word of God. That means you can't win in battle until you hear God. The key to victory in battle is the voice of God. That's the rema word. It's not the Bible verses you read. It's what God speaks to you. So those who win in battle are those who have mastered how to pick God's voice. You can pray, you can fast and still lose. So the goal of your prayer and fasting in warfare is not time, is to hear God. Because that sword of the spirit is what will cut off the neck of the Leviathan. And there are many people who have never heard God. That's why they are not candidates of battle. See, when we are talking warfare, these things are fundamentals. If you have not known righteousness, if you have not known salvation, if you are not a man of truth, if you are not a man prepared for preaching the gospel, and if you are not a man who hears God, forget about it. You are not a candidate for warfare. This is why you must know your weapons. Warfare does not end until God speaks. And when God speaks, the wisdom for your deliverance is crystallized. This is the first weapon of the believer. This is why many believers are victims. Because all we know is to come to church on Sunday and receive prophecy. You don't have people. Tell your church, let's go out to evangelism. That's when you will know the true members of that church. The size of the church is not those who come on Sunday. The tithe of the church is those who go for evangelism. And you'll be shocked that the church of 3,000, sometimes it's 50 that go for evangelism. Those are the ones who can fight you. Those are the ones who can fight. You'll be shocked. But this is the stark reality of what we are doing here. So if you want your church to become a church of warriors, take time. Teach them salvation. Teach them righteousness. Get all of them to actively participate in kingdom advancement. And then train them to hear God for themselves. That's why I told you this Christianity of Papa said, Daddy said, Prophet said, is a joke. I quote fathers here. I quote prophets. I quote elders. And I will show you that the prophetic word is also a weapon. But over and above that, you must hear God for yourself. We are raising babies. And we say we are raising the last day church. What we have is not yet the last day church. Oh. This church that even when people want to travel, Papa must talk to them. This church that when people want to do anything, they will hear Papa. And they have never heard God. Jesus said, my sheep heareth my voice. And they obey me. If we can't hear God, we can't fight. That's why the psalmist said, the Lord teaches my hands to war. And my fingers to fight. You must hear. When you pray, you must hear God. When you fast, you must hear God. When you study the Bible, you must hear God. If you will be able to fight the battles of God. These criteria have written, have, have called out a law. Some of you already know that. You know why you have been defeated. Sad, but truth. If you know how many Christians are casualties, you will nod your head and ask, what are we doing? Is it church? Meanwhile, go and see the church that Jesus raised. Ushers were taking cities. It's not, there was no ordination service. No ritual. Persecution came, they spread out. Philip went to Samaria, he took it. Some Christians traveled to Antioch, they took it. It was normal, everybody had capacity. Warrior church. Because when they go out for evangelism, all of them go. It's not for some, it's not for the poor. It's for the whole church. Number two. Weapon of war is the name of Jesus. He said the name of the Lord, Proverbs 18.10, is a strong tower. The righteous run it therein, they are saved. If you don't have confidence in the name of Jesus, you can't fight. Philippians 2 verse 9 and 10, because of what he did, 
God gave him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We win by our revelation, faith, and deployment of the name of Jesus Christ. It's not this one that there's an accident. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That one is fear. That one is nomenclature. I'm talking you know the authority that is in the name of Jesus that in the middle of the storm you say Jesus and it's enough. Because your life can anchor on it. Because you are calling it from revelation. You are not calling it from fear. Paul entered the shipwreck and he stood up and told the people fear not. There shall be no loss of life. The Lord whose I am and whom I serve stood by me yesterday and said no one shall die. That was all. There was no, hey, what will happen? Uh, Captain, what do we do? Hope you know that that ship still crashed. People swam. They were swimming out. But nobody died. Because the word is no but there shall be no loss of life. If you know the name of Jesus, when you call it, no matter how dark the battle gets, you will have your peace. Because you know that that name is Lordship. It means God has taken control. When you say Jesus, you mean God has taken control. That's the second weapon that gives us victory in warfare. Number three, prophetic words. When you are in battle, apart from the Rema word that you receive in your spirit, sometimes God sends prophetic words through others. If you neglect it, you are finished. Though. This is why in this faith, you must honor everybody. All this peak of Christianity, I'm the only one that hears God. I'm the only one that God is working with. You will enter a ditch, you'll be shocked. The way the faith is designed is such that there is interdependence. And sometimes, it's the person you are keeping malice with that God will send. If you refuse, you will die. Man of God, the Lord told me to tell you that in this battle, you need to fast for three days. You say, get out. What do you mean? Don't I hear God myself? You will hear God when you cross over to the other side. Arrogance will kill you. Psalm 107 verse 20. He sent his word. And he said, the word delivered them from all their oppression. How did he send it? He sent it by the prophets. Hosea chapter 12 verse 13. He said, by a prophet, he brought them out of Egypt. And by a prophet, they were preserved. And sometimes when God wants to humble you, it's your disciple he will send. May God help you to have discernment when he speaks. Your disciple that you feel is nothing will come and say, Sir, God told me that you are lying when you preach. If you don't stop, the ministry will end. <laughs> you will want to slap him. The Holy Ghost will say, It's true, it's true, it's true. Because some of the words will be corrosive. God will send somebody and the person, why do you think Eli died? A strange man just showed up and rebuked him. You have allowed your children to walk in iniquity and defy the sanctuary of God. And Eli took it for granted. That's why he died. That's why his family perished. He took it for granted. God may send somebody to tell you, sir, you have pride. And there's a battle coming. If you don't humble yourself, you will die. And if God does not help you, that pride will kill you. Prophetic word. Prophetic. Your job is to discern. When it's God speaking, even if he pays you, say, thank you. Go and pray. Pray so that you can receive the word. Because your next level depends on it. This is how we win. Oh. Some of the battles we win, we don't win because we fought. We win because God sent men. There are times when I'm going through battles. Somebody will just send a message from, from Congo, from London, and say, God says to tell you. You will not like it, but you know it's true. And if you want deliverance, you will do it. That's how this thing works. Number four, weapon for your victory in battle is the blood of Jesus Christ. I quoted that already. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb 
and by the words of their testimonies. And I told you, how do you overcome with the blood? It's by walking in light. Because that's how you release the power of the blood. If you walk in light as it is in light, then the blood of Jesus what? Cleanses you. So the power of the blood is activated when you walk in light. And then the power of the blood is activated by the words of your testimony. So the Bible said, when men are cast down, you say there's a lifting up. Because it's what you say that will determine whether you will come out. It said, keep me in remembrance of my word. Isaiah 43 verse 24. He said, by thy words thou shalt be condemned, and by thy words thou shalt be justified. Isaiah 44 verse 24. He said, I the Lord, I perform the words of my servant and the counsels of my messengers. I perform. So if you don't say it, you will not succeed. You will not excel. That's how you release the power. But see the way Satan trained us. We are used to speaking evil. Somebody will say, I am sick a hundred times. He will never say, by his stripes, I'm healed. You hear people say things like, I'm finished. Oh, I don't die. You go die. Even an angel won't be able to help you. Because even God will honor what you say. If you speak, you can be justified. And if you speak, you can be condemned. This is why you must learn to think and talk the word. Think, talk it, until even when you are unconscious, you are talking the word. That's what will bring you out of the pit. But the word system wants to put phrases and cliches in your lips. Meanwhile, you don't know that that's a way to dig your grave. You must learn to release the power of the blood. Number four, what weapon do we have against Satan? Is the leading of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Ghost begins to lead you, you become invincible. John 3, 8, it says, As the wind bloweth, thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. It says, So are they that are born by the Spirit of God. You read Psalm 23 from verse 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. He leadeth me beside the still waters. See the battle the man fought. He even went through the valley of the shadow of death. Yet he couldn't die. Because the Holy Ghost was his leader. If God leads you, everything you are going through is a potential testimony. These are weapons. And this is why through Christianity we teach you to apprehend these things for yourself. Because therein lies your victory. Number five. What's your weapon against Satan? And I will stop here. Is holy living. Ephesians 4 27, giving no place to the devil. Satan is looking for those who will give him a place. In 1 Peter 5 8, he says, Your adversary, the, the devil, is prying like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's those who give him space that he devours. If you don't give him space, he can't devour you. Ecclesiastics 10 8 says, If you break the hedge, he said, The serpent will bite you. So anything God gives you as a consecration, keep it. There are some of you here, the Holy Ghost tells you, leave alcohol. It's for your own good. Though. There are some of you, God tells you, leave womanizing. It's for your own good. Don't make us come and gather in the hospital and start trusting God. It may not work. Because, because it's in that hospital that you will truly repent. And God is more interested in your soul in heaven than for you to come on earth and go back to the brothel. So no matter how many of us gather, even if we see an angel descend, you will go to heaven that day. It's a precious in the eyes of the Lord. It's the dying of the saints. For the first time you are a saint, so God will take you home. Hi -yo, hi -yo, hi -yo. Encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters we activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy, Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you.
Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. 